اهلا وسهلا فيكم في اسبوع عمال التصميم نرحب بالسيد سهل حياري ماكس فريجر ومحمد الاسعد ماكس فريجر كاتب متخصص بالتصميم قيم معارض ومستشار واحد ابرز الاصوات في التصميم المعاصر واكثره احتراما شغرة فريجر نائب مدير مهرجان لندن للتصميم في الاعوام 2012 الى 2015 واسس لندن ديزاين جايد التي تصدر طبعتها الرابعه الان سيد سهل حياري المعماري المسؤول في مكتب سهل حياري معماريون حصل الحياري على شهادة الماجستير في العمارة بتخصص التصميم الحضري من جامعة هارفارد وقام بالتدريس في عدد من المعاهد المكرسة مثل هارفارد والجامعة الأمريكية في بيروت كما كان عضوا في لجنة التحكيم العليا لجائزة آغا خان للعمارة وعرضت أعماله ونشرت على المستوى العالمي محمد الأسعد حصل على شهادته العليا من جامعة الينوي وجامعة هارفارد بالإضافة إلى أبحاث ما بعد الدكتوراه من جامعة هارفارد وبرينستون والتي عمل مدرسا فيها عمل مدرسا في معهد ماسستوتشيس للتكنولوجيا للإم آي تي والجامعة الأردنية والجامعة الألمانية Thank you all for coming um, We actually met Max just this afternoon so we just had time to, to have a discussion with him and we decided what we're going to do is I'm going to ask a few questions for each of them rather than have a discussion between us that might go all over um, the place. So I will start um, with uh, Max. I just discovered today that he wrote his first book when he was 19 years old, which is quite an accomplishment and has been engaged in design since then. So um, let us start, Max, by just you giving us some background about um, what you've done, what you've studied, um, what your experiences are, and your involvement in the world of design, particularly with um, design festivals. Sure. Um, well, thank you very much. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you for having me here this evening. I'm totally in love with your country, by the way, uh, having spent a phenomenal few days here in Amman and traveling around the country to Petra, to uh, Wadi Rum, and the Dead Sea. Um, and to be able to do a talk outside is also a novelty for me. Um, it's a lovely setting here. So thank you, Armand Design Week, and well done in your first edition. Um, in answer to your question, uh, I'm now 36, by the way. Um, but yes, I had an idea for a book when I was 19, and it was called Design UK. And it was a guidebook to the best design shops, uh, galleries, and museums right across the UK, um, which might sound like a fairly obvious idea for a book. Um, but actually there was nothing like it on the market at that moment. It, and it came at a time when the design scene was really picking up, uh, picking up in the UK. Um, there was an increasing understanding of what design means and how it can um, really, I, I suppose people were, were gaining more confidence in the, um, using design in the way they want to use design within their own homes. Uh, so rather than following trends so much, they were having more confidence in buying the pieces that they want and creating their own environments. Um, so there was an appetite for purchasing design. So I um, created this book. It's a long story as to how that came about, and it sold very well, which was a relief. In, in parallel, I was very conscious that um, the book might not be a success and that perhaps I should study as well. So I, did a, um, I started a degree in furniture and product design. Um, and I did it for a term, and then I decided to stop. And the main reason for that was because I actually realized I didn't want to be a designer. Um, I was more interested in promoting it and celebrating it. And I didn't think that was something that you could be taught. It just had to kind of get on with it and do it. Um, thankfully, when the book came out, it sold well. Um, I did a second edition, uh, which led me um, into writing a book with Terence Conran uh, in 2004. Uh, and there's something interesting about writing a book because if you write a book, all of a sudden people think you know what you're talking about, um, which was very beneficial for me. So it led to a whole load of other work and, and I began traveling around the world. Um, equally, books are a very slow process. Uh, and they take a long time to do. So I started writing for various magazines and newspapers uh, and covering design as it happens. Uh, and then I started curating exhibitions, which are in many respects a kind of uh, a, a very similar process to editing a book. Uh, they just happen to be physical. Um, and then more recently, uh, I've 
begun consulting for various companies and for various governments around the world um, as to how they can implement design and how they can promote their own design cultures. Um, at certain point, I decided to get a proper job. Um, so I was offered the job to run the London Design Festival in 2014. Uh, and I stayed there for three years doing that um, until 2015. Um, and I suppose that's when the experience I had of traveling the world and seeing other design festivals became very relevant to me in organizing one, albeit one that was at that stage, um, I think it was 10 years old, so it was much more established. Um, and it's interesting to see that now I think there are something like 100 design weeks in the world, roughly. I don't know if anyone's counting. Uh, 95, thank you. Um, and London Design Festival was one of the first. Um, if you don't know, it's taking place in a few weeks' time. Do come to London for it. Um, and, well, maybe we can expand on design festivals a little bit more as, as the discussion goes on. Um, but it's great to see Amman now staging their first. Um, last year, Dubai staged its first. Um, so maybe there's something bubbling up in the region. I don't know. Over the, the past, what, 18 years you've been involved in this area, what major changes do you feel have happened in the design world? Um, it's interesting to talk about major changes because, of course, things tend to happen incrementally. Um, but, you know, if we look at, if, if we look at the, the title of this talk, The Designer's New Skin, I mean, one of the reasons that we came up with this topic discussion is because certainly something I've noticed since I began was uh, that the approach of designers has changed quite drastically, certainly in London and, and the market that I'm most observant of. Um, you have designers, I, I re very much remember when I began, there were designers who, independent designers who would have a new product or a new idea and they would exhibit it within an exhibition during the London Design Festival and they would have their space and they would stand there next to their products and look, looking rather sheepish and a little bit kind of coy, um, like, you know, the dog in the window that wants to have a new home. and. Um, it was a little bit soul-destroying, and I would ask them, you know, what, it, what is it you want to achieve by exhibiting here? And they'd say, oh, I'm hoping that a manufacturer will see my design and take it on and produce it. Um, I think a lot of them quite quickly realized that that wasn't really going to happen. Um, the main reason for that, having talked to a lot of manufacturers, is that they like to f feel like they've discovered their a designer themselves, or they've commissioned a design from scratch. So as soon as it's exposed, it's no longer new and fresh, so why would they produce it? Um, in parallel, and this sounds extraordinary now, but really in the early noughties, um, we were still dealing with the internet as a dial-up. You know, you remember that? When, with a modem dial-up, and, and, and websites were really basic. And, um, but of course, as, as the internet has matured and grown, designers all of a sudden have their own platform to promote themselves. So they're no longer so reliant on that manufacturer client. Uh, and there's a sort of entrepreneurial spirit that's come about. Uh, um, and that's a definitive shift. So designers almost producing, the, the designers as brands, producing their own products and using technologies that enable them to produce perhaps one or 10 or 100 of something rather than this mass production model. Um, and of course, they're, they're able to sell the product directly to the consumer through the various channels that we have. And then, of course, social media exploded after that. So, you know, everyone is their own marketeer. Um, uh, and, and I think that's really liberated a lot of designers. On top of that, uh, an increase in the technologies that are available. Um, so, uh, I mean, rapid, rapid prototyping is not particularly a new phenomenon. Uh, and, uh, but it's enabled designers to work and create very quickly. Um, and I think this, this notion of a designer being able to uh, implement their uh, design much quicker than the traditional routes means that they can get it to market, they can put it out there and move on. Uh, and so I think it's, it's sped things up a bit. Um, also, sorry, I'm talking loads. Um, also, um, we have uh, online magazines with the likes of Design and Design Boom and these kind of platforms that promote new designs from around the world constantly, every couple of hours. Um, and that's really internationalized the design scene, I think. So 
uh, wherever you are in the world, you're able to read about uh, new designs that are, that are coming out, uh, which on the one hand is a great thing. On the other hand, I think it's created a, um, a slightly dangerous scenario where designers are perhaps creating for that screen um, a little bit too much. And perhaps by virtue of the fact that we're so well connected, there's a, perhaps a kind of homogenization of design style taking place where um, success, uh, you're, you're considered successful if you are on these platforms and promoted internationally. Um, the media doesn't always promote good design, it promotes um, showy design mm. sometimes. And I think that's a, perhaps a dangerous territory which maybe we can talk about some more. We'll come back to some of these issues. Um, to move on to Sahel, uh, some of you probably do not know that Sahel actually studied both fine arts and architecture, and he's a painter and an architect. I'm the proud owner of one of your paintings. <laughs> and um, it'll be interesting for you also to give us an overview of your own educational and professional journey, which is a long one by now. Yes, actually. yes, yes. Um, well, I uh, studied architecture um, and fine arts in Rhode Island School of Design, uh, after which I, uh, and of course, uh, before doing that, there was this ongoing confusion about what to do with my life, basically. Am I a uh, visual artist or an architect? And I kind of liked both. And I um, eventually found this school that provided uh, both of the dis disciplines at the same time, and I, I took my degrees from RISD. After which I went to um, Harvard University, and I did uh, a, a master's in urban design. And immediately after, I came back to the Middle East, where I worked for a year. I worked for a year in Egypt uh, in a commercial firm, uh, which made me want to stop uh, working altogether. So <laughs> I uh, decided to go to do um, a doctorate in um, architectural composition in Italy, in Venice. And I did three years of that, but then I decided that uh, academia was not really the trajectory I uh, uh, wanted to take. Um, so I decided to come back to Jordan and start working. And uh, in the mid-90s, I came back, started working with uh, Jafar Toan, which was a nice way kind of to be uh, re, uh, re-plugged into the system. And, um, uh, and then in 2000, I had already started my own very small firm. It's still very small. And I occasionally, uh, I mean, I dabble with paintings, installations, and so on. And uh, this is what I've been doing. Um, and finally, recently, the, 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 the exhibition here of Amman Design Week, I, um, I was very glad to be part of it. Uh, and I um, designed and curated the exhibition at the hangar. So. Do you feel that as someone who's worked on the scale of a small painting, the scale of a building, and the scale of the city, how has that made you, or how has that affected your perception of the visual world around us? Or it hasn't, maybe, I don't it, know. It, it really, I don't think scale is an issue. I mean, I don't think really scale is an issue. I think it's a matter of context and uh, the elements you're working with. Uh, when you're doing an exhibition, it's entirely different than when you're uh, um, furnishing an apartment, obviously. Uh, a smaller scale can be much more difficult, to be honest. So um, I think the scale is a relative thing in terms of... But it's, it's, it's also very interesting to sort of um, engage with different projects of different scales. I certainly would like to maintain that in my practice and not only focus on small things or... I, I don't look at it this way. I don't think, you know, scale is, uh, uh, you know, conducive to excellence, you know. I think it's uh, what you do with uh, what you have, basically. Okay, um, to move on to the, um, the Amman Design Week, this has been a very long journey for you, and I remember, you know, there were... No, it hasn't, actually. It's only been six months. That's so. a long journey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I remember there were times you were staying till 10 o'clock at night, and, and, and yes, it was a very yeah. exhausting experience. It's a very interesting journey, and I'm sure you went through a lot. And it would be interesting if you would give us an impression of that journey, you know, from the moment you were commissioned to the moment of the opening, 
in terms of what vision you had, what you set out to do, uh, what challenges you faced as you set them, what you were able to accomplish, and so on? Yeah, it, well, it started with panic, and panic sort of continued throughout the process, but uh, I was but very lucky. That's your trademark, yeah, panicking yeah, is your yeah, trademark. Panic, so. panic. But I was very lucky, actually, I had two wonderful directors that uh, already had this great idea about uh, revitalizing uh, parts of the city that have been forgotten and uh, that, that they wanted to focus on the three venues uh, to do different uh, uh, activities within the, uh, or exhibitions within the venues and I was, uh, they asked me to uh, curate the show at the hangar and I said yes because I thought the whole idea of connecting these, this, this, these three elements and kind of creating the spine within the city is an essential of is of an essential importance in a design week because it's it's also the connection with the city and how people experience the city in events as such where there is kind of um, uh, an altered perception where you see the space you live in in a new under with a new lens sort of but to go back to the hangar and what I did at the hangar um, <clears throat> my first impulse of course was to uh, painted all gray, and I did that. And, but I, um, the, the, the most important thing I thought it would be very interesting as opposed to having an international show to do a regional show, to actually look at what we have in terms of uh, products and designers and ideas in the region and to see Net uh, Amman as a part of a network of cities in the region. Uh, and so this is what I try to focus on and uh, to engage sort of the local scene with a more regional scene and then to put it all together uh, in, in some kind of a comprehensive way that covers a lot of disciplines as well and that was the intention. Uh, one of the most uh, conscious, conscious uh, uh, efforts I tried to or, or you know decisions is to avoid uh, thematizing the show uh, to, because being the first show, actually, it would have been very difficult to kind of, uh, given the time constraints as well, to um, start to commission work according to one theme. Hopefully this can come later, but for the first show, I just wanted the, uh, the visitors to understand what the region is capable of in terms of design and what design can do in terms of changing one experience of space, of a familiar space, let's say. And uh, so, um, Another aspect that uh, was very important to me is that uh, design is not always done by designers. There are many people who are not formally trained uh, as designers who produce wonderful things, and we have quite a few of them in the show that, uh, that are being presented for the first time. And I was very, very happy to find them and to come across their work and to engage them in this process uh, that we had during the six months. Um, so. Also, this, this, you know, we started this whole idea of collaborations where, you know, uh, we would put two designers together. It happened once mainly, but um, uh, uh, this, I think, was very important and it would be wonderful to repeat it again in the next uh, design weeks. Uh, as well as asking certain uh, uh, designers to do something that is not really um, within the norms of what they usually do. So, f for example, graphic designers were asked to design tiles and to experiment with that. So, changing the medium a little bit for designers can be uh, quite fruitful and exciting. And uh, so, this is how that process uh, unfolded. Um, and I, I, I think the, the ultimately what I wanted to um, to do is to create this, 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 this experience where, you know, a visitor who um, doesn't really know much about design, and I think the design industry in Jordan is not very well developed. We also have a problem with, uh, um, uh, um, you know, manufacturing, craftsmanship, the loss of craftsmanship, I, and I thought it would be very interesting to kind of introduce people to the value of good craft and to the value of uh, 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 quality, high, high quality things. And I think, because I think they are ultimately the more sustainable things, things that you hold on to and don't throw away, unlike what you see nowadays, which, you know, there is an, uh, an overproduction of objects that, you know, are basically flooding the markets everywhere. Uh, 
So, yeah, that's... You probably went through a process of surveying what's around and, and, and selecting. Um, could you say something about how you went around? Was it a methodolic, methodolic, methodological process? Was well, it? Th there was actually um, coincidences. Uh, you told me there were a few coincidences. In there fact. were coincidences. For example, Ziad Qureder is uh, the one who does this exquisite embroidery. Is somebody I've known for years and years, and I didn't know he was really. I, I mean, I knew he he embroidered, but I didn't know the extent of what he can do. And so, by coincidence, I, uh, I realized that what he was doing, and it was an immediate kind of, you have to do something for the show. And I just challenged him to do one piece, one more piece, because he said, that, no, they're extremely difficult, and it, 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 it takes a lot of uh, time. And then he produ produced something like a hundred of them. He got very excited, and he did, he did a marvelous job, really. So, yeah, we, we, I had a few of these. Um, uh, of course, I had a lot of help from people. You ask, people tell you, people introduce you to, to uh, other designers, you know, and uh, I think this is how it is, is creating this platform of networks of uh, 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 a network where kind of you get information from the most kind of unlikely people. So this is how it was. It was more organic. It wasn't really structured. We did have a list right, of all uh, the local and all the well-known local and international design, uh, regional designers, and uh, so we used that list, but I think the, the list was kind of discarded and the process became much more organic. Yeah, beyond that. I yeah, mean. yeah, I think we did. Um, I, uh, what I'd like to see for the next uh, um, um, Amman Design Week basically is more research in countries that we don't know much about. I mean, I went as far as Morocco to find uh, one, uh, one designer, but it would be interesting to understand what's happening in North Africa, uh, some of the uh, countries of the Gulf, Oman, I tried to, but we had time constraints, so we had to make do with what we had, basically. Yeah. Max, um, you know, you've seen design festivals all around the world. And it would be interesting to hear from someone like you, how would you assess critically what is happening here, considering that this is the first time? Um, where do you place it within, let's say, the map of, of different design festivals and events taking place around the world? Oh. <laughs> uh, hmm. OK. Um, yeah, I'm fortunate in what I do to, to travel and, and see design festivals everywhere. and. You know, there's a, there's a sort of well-trodden path. S sort of Milan is the kind of beacon that we hold up as the most important in the world. And it is. And it's been going for many, many, many years. Uh, and it has an inherent uh, design culture in Italy, of course. Um, uh, you know, London, Paris, New York, you know. The ob there are some obvious cities. Um, uh, wh when I was... Um, I had, a, I had a Skype conversation with, with Rana and um, Abir, uh, the directors of, of this design week, uh, and I, let them, I just let them talk, tell me about it, and um, they filled my heart with joy because, um, you know, it, it becomes very tedious sometimes when countries uh, or, or cities try to replicate what they see in places like Milan or London and so on and they just ship it in. They, they bring in the obvious brands, they bring in the same stuff. I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna travel halfway around the world to see that stuff. Um, I've seen it already, and um, it was great to hear that the emphasis here in Amman was going to be local. Uh, that is exactly what I want to see as an international visitor. Uh, and I think it, it strikes me that the design uh, scene here in Amman and Jordan is, is quite young still. Um, and it's growing and the enthusiasm um, and uptake is growing um, and, and how great to be able to showcase uh, some of the best work that's happening at the moment um, and, and something that a design week does is inject energy into a sector or, or um, a design scene in this case uh, and I think like I was saying before about how we can sometimes live too much online and in this sort of international bubble um, of exposure through these, these online platforms. Um, a design week is physical. You know, people get 
off their seats, they come out, they go to new spaces like the hangar, they, uh, and here and, 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 and the crafts district, they see things physically, they touch, they talk. Um, the networking compo component of a design week is essential, I think, because that's when collaboration is born, when designers talk to each other and things happen. So perhaps for the second edition, we'll see more collaborations from this edition. Um, uh, I think the, um, in many respects, any first design week should be, should be treated as a prototype. Um, and having said that, this is a bloody good prototype. Um, and I really mean that because the coordination of it, I think, is, is really professional. The branding, the identity, the signage, the, the buses that take you from ABC. Um, you know, the fact that the design week is anchored in these key locations really helps. Um, and then, of course, uh, I think the, although there are, of course, things happening around the city in individual locations, to me, a design week is very much about uh, embracing the whole city and inviting the city to participate uh, as much as possible. And, and um, when I was at the London Design Festival, um, we today have something like 300 events around the city, which arguably is now too much and too big. Um, but something we, we talked about, what we never implemented, was trying to sort of police the quality of those events. Um, and that just felt wrong. You know, I think a design week is an inclusive event and should embrace, it should, it should be open doors for people to just create, whatever that may be. Uh, the beauty of the word design is that it's, ma it's massively versatile. Um, uh, and, and interestingly, actually, traveling around Jordan the last few days and talking to people, ra random people that I've met, you know, why are you in, here in Jordan? Uh, well, I'm here for Amman Design Week. And they go, Amman has a design week? I say, yes, the first one, you should go. So you'll get some extra visitors. But aside from that, some, some people, I mean, I'm talking taxi drivers and things, you know, they, they even ask, well, what, what do you mean by design? And that was fascinating for me because I think, I, I don't know if it's, I think we probably all live in a bit of a bubble where we assume people know what this word is. Um, and I really had to explain, well, design is kind of everything we touch, um, you know, furniture, product, graphics, fashion, you, you know, you name it. Um, well, um, and, and then they go, ah, okay. So I think um, also hearing from the directors about what they've seen so far and the feedback from visitors, you know, there have been all sorts of people coming through the door, and that is fantastic. It's not just a design scene. It's not uh, an elitist event, which uh, any design week runs the risk of being, I think, or any industry event for that matter. There, there are people of all ages, of all backgrounds, coming and learning and seeing. Uh, and so the conversation can only grow. Um, so, uh, I would say massive thumbs up, well done uh, for the first edition. I think something that personally I, th I would like to see more of next time um, is uh, an embrace, and, th and this I hope ties into the subject of the talk, an embrace of, of some of the real core problems that we face today, you know, and, and the world has too many of them. Um, you know, I was two nights ago sleeping in, in Wadi Rum uh, in, a, in a luxury camp um, with water. And I felt like an idiot every time I used the water. You know, why on earth should I have a shower in one of the most water-starved parts of the world? You know, and this is a big problem for Jordan. So, you know, it would be, would be fascinating to set the challenge to the, to the design community here. You know, what, what are some interesting, really imaginative ideas that might um, help solve this problem going forward. And the problem will, will only get worse. And of course, the problem is the opposite in somewhere in other parts of the world where there's too much water and so on. And, and I think this is one of the most exciting parts of where the design scene is heading. In a world that has so much stuff already where we don't really need any more chairs uh, or any more um, of, of the stuff that clutters our lives. Um, the opportunities for designers are enormous in solving problems, um, uh, to solve some of these problems. I'm not saying that designers on their own can do it, um, but there are organizations uh, and um, government bodies and so on that they can collaborate with. And in, in many respects, it's a very exciting time for design. And I would like to see designers working on the boards of um, major companies, 
I'd like to see designs um, in infiltrating government uh, departments. Um, because I think designers, one of the great skills that they bring to the table is uh, a propensity to solve problems. Sure. Uh, we all have that propensity. We all have that um, uh, skill in many respects. But I'm always amazed by how designers do it. That just whenever I've set a brief to a designer, and I think I've really done a good brief, and they really, I kind of think I know what I'm going to get. Boy, it's never, it's never what I'm going to get. You know, their their brains go like this, and then they come to here, uh, and and that's tremendously exciting. And that's one of the things I get up for every day. So you feel that um, problem solving is one of the issues we should probably emphasize more as we move ahead with such an exercise? I mean, you were mentioning to me over lunch that the United Kingdom government, for example, is hiring designers actually as, as employees to help them solve or address certain problems. How do you feel this can happen here? You mentioned water, for example, as, as, as one possibility. But could you elaborate a bit more on, on how you see designers taking a bigger role in addressing the challenges you face in a developing context such as that of Jordan? Yeah, I mean, I make it sound easy. Uh, and it's not. It's, it's much easier to sit down and design a product uh, and make it and sell it. Um, and I think that in, in some respects is kind of, kind of the problem. Um, we're, we're sort of burying our heads in the sand a little bit as to some of the problems that we have. Um, what we really need, and I don't have the answer, but what I think we really need is some, uh, we need conduits between different bodies. In other words, we need the glue that binds uh, the design talent with the investors, with the, the policy makers, with the um, construction industry, and so on. Um, and, and somehow there needs to be a, desi a, a common desire for, for, for a solution that isn't um, harbored by uh, politics and uh, corruption and greed and, and all of these things that hamper um, progress. Um, it, it's not easy, it's not something that can happen overnight. Uh, and often the best ideas happen on a, on a grassroots level, I think. I don't think you can try and get there until you do some things down here. Um, I, I heard a great example. He's sitting right here. Uh, uh, Hannah, who, who designed the, this uh, installation here, you know, working on this project with the, the two, the two um, towers that are, are lying empty here in Armand, that are the very controversial construction projects. And, and some great ideas there as to how those towers could be used in a different way that isn't all about luxury apartments and shopping malls and all the things that we don't really need. Um, let's reappropriate them. Let's, you know, uh, there's all sorts of ideas around urban gardening and, and um, solar parks and all this kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, Armand is an interesting example. I'm still learning about it with everybody I speak to. I'm certainly no in expert on it, but it's hearing its history and its culture, it's, it's growing tremendously fast and that poses extraordinary challenges for, 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 for the powers that be that run this city uh, and, and of course its inhabitants. And water is one of those, um, energy consumption is another. Um, the the uh, congestion with, on the roads is really a problem. It's really, and the pollution that comes with it. Um, you, you know, sometimes it just takes uh, it just takes somebody that's brave enough to come forward with an idea that might be a little bit crazy and a little bit mad and put it out there. And, and uh, the channels that we have to put ideas out to the public are there. And, and hey, let's just test the water. And you never know who might pick up on those ideas. And then things start to move forward. And public support gets behind it, and so on and so on. Um, and, and maybe some of those crazy grassroots ideas can be celebrated here next year. Sahel, um, we, we, we talked about this a bit. Uh, you made a very bold and somewhat controversial decision to paint everything black. <laughs> Could you it's, talk a bit about it's that? It's not black, actually. It's Sorry, it's charcoal, charcoal with some blue. <laughs> okay. um, no, basically, it's a, it, it's a very basic decision. It was to neutralize the space and to make reference to the to the old function which uh, obviously it was uh, generators that produced a lot of soot so that was the the intent with the color 
But basically, uh, it wants to unify everything and to create this uh, uniform background for uh, the exhibit. Uh, I think that was the, the intent behind this. Uh, I don't think it's that bold, actually, of a move. It just came naturally, so uh, uh, that's what we did. Yeah. You've talked about, you know, if, if, if you were involved in this in the future, you, you mentioned, for example, you'd like to expand the geographic borders to, to maybe look into North Africa uh, and so on. I think it would be very um, interesting, and I'm, I'm extremely interested in designers working with very limited resources and how they manage sort of to push the envelope and boundaries. Obviously, it would be fantastic if we could find even simple simple products that, that do address a problem, basically. I mean, we have, I, we have products in the hangar that, that deal with, uh, that, that uh, propose uh, plates for the elderly. I mean, it's a simple thing, but it does solve uh, a problem. Uh, it would be amazing to, 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 to find that. And, uh, but my interest, my particular interest, is, is people working with very poor materials. And uh, it kind of, um, taking traditional techniques and pushing them to, to, to new dimensions, uh, basically. So, um, and yes, the participation of, of that part of the world would be very interesting and it would bring in, I think, uh, an interesting perspective of, of what's happening around us and in countries that have a similar culture and face similar challenges as well, right? Uh, yeah. Well, you also talked about the idea of linking, and, and you, Max, also mentioned that, the idea of linking this exhibition to the city, that it has to be uh, an integral uh, part uh, of the city. Absolutely, and I think, I think we've done it this time in this location at the hangar. I think next year, or um, um, we, should, we should look at other venues in the city, possibly forgotten venues or, you know, um, buildings that are not in use. And... Uh, and, and target, target them and just show the potentials of what these structures can do because there is a lot of destruction happening and, and they're being destroyed actually by the simple fact uh, uh, that they're not being used, you know. We have all of these cinemas in Amman, wonderful cinemas in downtown that are abandoned and the state of abandon actually is what uh, uh, allowing these buildings to, to fall apart and we lose them eventually. And I think once something like that is lost, it can never be uh, uh, brought back. So if, if it would be interesting to do that and to create uh, uh, the event as a network of, uh, uh, of, of, of exhibitions or events that actually aim to restore some of the uh, uh, buildings that are uh, facing uh, these challenges, basically. I think that would be very interesting uh, to do. If I can build on that, um, as someone who's also engaged in planning, urban planning, what would your mental map of Amman be? I mean, in some ways we've started, and I think this is a very good beginning, with the central part of the city, with where the city was born in some ways, Ragadan and here. Uh, you talked that maybe one should go into, for example, Shar al Malk Hussein and these Shara areas. Shar al also. But also, which, uh, yeah. if you look at Sorry. Amman, what's your mental reading of it? Like, let's say this expands, and, and as Max was saying, you had 300 events taking place all over London. How would you read Amman in connection with upcoming um, design festivals? How, how would, would you go into the new areas? Would you emphasize revitalizing I, I, the older areas? I think I think the new areas are um, the new areas are being used, obviously, and there is uh, being very well taken care of. And there is this uh, kind of uh, uh, collapse between and and these very very apparent seams in the cities that kind of uh, separate it. I mean, there are these almost visual scenes uh, scenes that I think we have to cross and reconnect. And I think one of the most important things is that people from West Amman were able to come downtown again. I mean, some of them haven't been in, 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 in this area for years, right? So, I mean, what about if we, uh, uh, if that happens in, or occurs in other, other, other places in the city? I think this is very important. I do not like this whole idea of a master plan. I think it's, uh, especially with Amman, I don't think it works because it's a very arbitrary city. What you need to look at, I think, is uh, focus on 
certain locations and work locally and work from within and not try to impose some kind of a, a master plan on the city uh, uh, for this event or for any other thing, I think. I think that's, in my opinion, the best way to, to deal with the city like Amman. It's, it's, a, it's a very complex city and it's, uh, it started to kind of uh, develop a lot of boundaries and scenes and I think it would be very interesting to, to try to work on these scenes and try to reconnect them, repatch it somehow. Uh, Max, this probably isn't very fair. I mean, you're someone who only spent maybe two, three days in Amman. But from your initial impressions, how would you actually think of upcoming design festivals within the context of Amman? Uh, what, what impressions as an outsider come to your mind? Or what, what issues do you feel should be explored? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I've had a, once upon a time a very surreal conversation with a Chinese organization and I was when I was working at the London Design Festival and I went through a, a long process of carefully explaining all the components of the design festival and all the things that we try to achieve and they sat there nodding and then the lady asked me okay how much would it cost us to do that and I said well where she said well in Beijing and I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You're, you're missing the point. Um, you have to embrace the geography, the, 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 the very core nature of the city, the, the residential population, the, the business population. You, you have to kind of really read your own city. And, and I think you have to be from that city in order to do it. Um, uh, and she went away going, oh, right, OK. I had a nice big checkbook. Um, and uh, so, so I think one of the great things about design festivals around the world is that they um, celebrate the local and they celebrate the flavor of their city. Um, so that said, I, can, I could talk forever about London. For me to answer your question about Oman is very difficult because my knowledge of the city is, is minuscule. I, um, I'm still getting to grips with how it, it is all laid out uh, and where the different hubs and things are. But I think um, one of the things that I enjoy most about traveling into these different cities is, is not only the exhibits and seeing what's on display, but it's also getting an idea of what the city is about and where the, where the hot spots are and where the, the kind of underground scene is and where the establishment hang out and all of that. And, uh, and I'd love to learn that more. And I think as a, as a design festival um, evolves, um, you know, what would be great to see is an embrace of, of some of these other areas around the city. You know, is, is there a place, for example, where all the little um, craft workshops are and could they be opened up? Uh, is there a place where you have all of the uh, glitzy, furniture showrooms and could they do something um, and and one way that we dealt with um, the kind of and, and that by the way should be organic it shouldn't be forced um, and, and that organic growth hap has happened in London to the extent now that we have 300 events and one way that we then have had to d had to deal with that is to create what we call design districts um, which were kind of where there were natural clusterings of events going on we would promote them and ask them to do stage all of their openings on the same night, for example, um, to m maximize the efficiency of people's time traveling around the city. London, as you probably all know, is enormous. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, those, I I'm sure some of those things are happening this year, and I'd love to see those grow, and I'd love to see the, 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 that sort of um, kind of rich tapestry of what Arman's history is and how it relates into contemporary culture today. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah sort yeah. of. <laughs> uh, uh, Sahel, uh, I'm going to go back to the issue of scale. If you were to dream and, and to really um, think of where this can be, I mean, we have such a powerful, strong start in, in, in five years or ten years. Um, on the level of actual exhibits and on the level of the connection of this event to Amman, where would you like it to be? I mean, where, where would you dream that such a thing will be? 
then in terms of creating a new environment for design, in terms of exploring new frontiers, wh wh what do you see? I, I think the, like the see? impact on, on, on the city is probably the most powerful. Uh, I think that what, that's what sort of inspires a lot of people to do things. You know, when you live in a vibrant city, you, you know, you, you, you somehow want to produce and, and work and come up with ideas and so on. I think that's very important. I think that, that's where I'd like uh, the, the design week to head. In terms of, you were talking about exhibits, definitely higher quality. I don't think you s start with a level and then go below that. I mean, higher quality, more interesting projects that, that tackled what I had mentioned before, but that's my personal interest. And I think, you know, it would be interesting that uh, um, uh, uh, not only one curator does this, that I can do it for one year, somebody else has to come in and do another thing, and it's not, uh, it's, it, it should not be a monopoly of, <laughs> of some sort where, you know, Sahel keeps on doing the same, uh, that, that doesn't work. I think you need different curators, you need to attract and, uh, um, uh, and, um, and create the, 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 the structure and the mechanism to allow other people to sort of propose different things. And I think this is what makes it vibrant because otherwise it will stagnate, I think. If, 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 you... um, if I could just, just add to that, this notion of growth is an interesting one. Mm. Um, we're, we live in, yeah, yeah. We, I mean, this, we, we live in a, in a world that's obsessed with growth. And, and I, as I said about London, I think the design festival in London is, is now too big, and Milan is is too big, and I think we're. It's. Uh, I totally agree. Let's go go for quality, really great thinking in that respect. It doesn't have to get bigger for the sake of it. It's more sustainable, actually. Quality. I think when you have when you produce objects of quality, even though the if it's another chair, and I think we all need a new nice chair every once in a while. But if you uh, produce a chair. And if it's of high quality, it, it somehow is not as easily discarded as something else. So I think quality also retains some kind of sustainability within it. It's embedded. And I think this is something that um, many don't see, you know, that, that the importance of, of quality. Um, and that doesn't mean, you know, um, um, expensive things. I mean, we have products that are done with very simple materials, but they're done with a lot of care and with an extreme eye of proportions, you know, uh, the work of Shams Art, for example, uh, that they use discarded building materials and, and they do it very elegantly and it's quite poetic and uh, it's, but it's, and you can contrast it to something that is, you know, made in Italy and it still holds its ground, actually. I think this is the kind of work we need to look at. But after, I mean, you've completed this phase, is there a frontier you feel you missed or um, something you wish you would have done that you have not done as you reflect back on it? Or maybe it's too early to ask I think question? it's too early because I, um, I mean, I really haven't had the time to step back and reflect on what happened. It just, I had this task to fulfill and I ju was just doing it and it was happening as... <laughs> As you know, uh, it was, yeah, yeah, sort of, sort of, so, yeah. But sometimes um, people point out things to you, maybe later on. But now, I mean, maybe people are coming to you and saying, what about this or what about that? Or there's a certain person we wish you looked yes, at. Yes, of course, um, you know, of course I did. In that sense, is there something I'm you should sure have missed many, many. No, is there something that comes to your mind at this stage? Not really. I mean, what I would like to, to have the opportunity of doing more is to look, look, look at people who are not necessarily trained in design. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. this is one aspect I'd like to really focus on. And, um, and look at craftsmen and what they do. And then try to pair them up with designers maybe so you can have these collaborations. I think this would be a very interesting thing to explore. Um, but we sort of kind of grazed it lightly and, and we need to really dig deep into that and I think that would be a uh, uh, plus, it would be definitely great for the next uh, Amman Design Week. Um, we're running out of time or? Two, two people to, okay. So I guess we have around 10 minutes or something like that. If you have any questions, we'd be happy.
to have Sahel or Max answer them, please. Uh, but please try to make your questions as short and concise as possible. Um, uh, are you thinking of having a, a place in Amman that will continue this creativity throughout the year, even if it's very small, so people can have a continuous dialogue, or is it only going to be throughout the design week? That's an interesting question. Um, hopefully, I think through... I think it doesn't happen like that directly. I think you need to do a few of them and to start to establish uh, a more vibrant design culture that would eventually uh, <laughs> that would eventually um, uh, lead to something like that. Um, I also think that there are in Amman uh, 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 very small uh, uh, organizations that do things at the grassroots level, and I think that does exist. But what would be very interesting is to engage them and to kind of, uh, 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 you know, use them and you know uh, to 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 uh, also, how do you say, it? disseminate kind of like. Uh, this whole idea of uh, improving the design culture and the built environment and so on and so forth. If I, if I could just add to that, I, I don't necessarily believe it's the role of the design week to, to do, uh, to stage or, or have something all year round. I think actually one of the great attributes of a design week is that it acts um, as an organization, it acts as a sort of magnet for those people that want to do something. Uh, and and, and it's, a, it's a deadline um, and it's, uh, it's, it's almost like a dating agency, if you like, for, for people who want to do something and, and, and it's like a matchmaking service, uh, you know, perhaps they, of course, if they're in the middle of conversations, they can pick and choose things, they can create collaborations, they can perhaps match a, a manufacturer or a brand with a designer, you know, there's all sorts of possibilities that can come just through the very existence of the design week. So this is early days and, and I'm sure they've got heaps of ideas as to what may come for year two, just off the conversations that have already happened in the last five, four or five days. Another question? Come on, yeah, we go. Where's that microphone gone? Oh, yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Mr. Max. You mentioned how we have a problem of water here in Jordan, but the first person to think of uh, to solve the problem is an environmentalist. I wouldn't imagine a, a designer would do that. Um, how do you, and, and you mentioned the glue of different people to collaborate on, on a problem. What would you imagine to be a map to the future of solving this problem to, to put environmentalists, designers, Etc. To, to be able to tackle this problem? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And as I said before, it's certainly not an easy one to solve. Uh, yes, an environmentalist, uh, there's a whole raft of people who'd be involved. Um, you know, without the support of the municipality or indeed central government, these sorts of things won't go anywhere. The investment costs are enormous. The infrastructural costs are enormous. But I think um, I would love to, to, to see a, a unit... Um, created within central government, uh, and, and maybe it exists, I don't know, that is purely looking to tackle this problem and creating uh, think tanks and workshops uh, with a whole raft of people with amazing expertise from around the world uh, who can work together, bounce ideas off each other. Um, you know, if you don't start to do these kind of exercises which are perhaps wild card and a little bit out there uh, to begin with, um, you've, got to, you've got to have ideas that are up here in order to get here. Um, and, and, and that has to come from a central organization like the government in the case of water uh, and, and many of the other problems. And, and, and indeed a lot of charities from around the world. You know, the expertise of people from, from around the world in solving a problem like this can only um, be a beneficial thing um, for the future. And, 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 and reading that Jordan is the third uh, most water, what's the, what's the expression? Most water-deprived nation in the world is is is, is terrifying, um, and and you know we're already starting to see conflicts 
coming about through water. It's no longer about oil. <laughs> so, you know, cr crack the problem now. I, I'd also like to um, say something is that actually I, I do think it's a design problem. It's not only environmentalists. I mean, there are water catchment systems that you can build. You can integrate this, you know, that can be integrate, integrated within the way the city is, is composed and urbanistically done. Um, there are simple technologies that, you know, a lot of designers use, you know, like the shower, for example, that doesn't, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Um, so I think it's, 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 um, it's, it's a collaboration between engineers, science, and, and environmentalists and designers to, 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 to also make products that are, you know, uh, uh, save water or that use water effectively and in a, in a way that does not waste it. I absolutely agree, and, and we all have an individual role to play in, in this problem, and indeed uh, implementing changes within your own home and so on is something we're all responsible for. But I was um, uh, reading up about the water issue here in Jordan, and um, I don't know if you knew this already, but uh, fr from the, the water source to uh, you guys, uh, a third of water is lost. Uh, in the pipes and the infrastructure. You know, that's ludicrous. That's unacceptable. Um, so, of course, there's a, an infrastructural, major infrastructural problem. Um, and, and I think another, you know, some of the best design problems have really embraced uh, nature, um, uh, really, really studied how nature op works and operates. And, and I think there's a lot of things that we can learn from how nature um, survives and exists uh, animals and, and insects and so on and, and plants exist in water deprived parts of the world and, and are there some things there to explore that can be extracted for mankind in the built environment I don't know possibly you know things like that um, that kind of thinking um, yes yeah yeah My question would be, a uh, couple of days ago, uh, I have a product design company in term for plastics. So I get my son, 16 year old, and he's usually fascinated with problem solving, but really worried of art. He doesn't like art. And I told him, let's go to the design week and hoping he would be inspired by the design process and the problem solving of it. But his reaction was, look, it looks like a room at a modern art museum. It's too, art, it, it, the art level is too focused, too, a lot of art within the design. It has to be there, but it does not include a lot of product, a lot of mass produced item that can be more democratic to every people's touch and part of their daily life uh, to do this. Do you have a comment about this? Yes, okay. I have a comment on this. Is what you see actually in the, in the hangar is a result of uh, a search of what's actually happening in the design community in the Middle East and in the region in general. And there is this kind of nebulous relationship between design and art. And it, it does present itself as that. And part of the reason is because there's a lot of things made by hand and they're not mass produced. As I mentioned before, we don't have these um, kind of, we don't have this um, mass production machine that, that, that produces things. Most of the things we get are from China. And uh, we don't have a lot of product designers working on that. And the one that we have is actually in the hangar. So, uh, so I don't think, the hangar would be probably the place to show products from China. I don't think that's, you know, the intent. But in terms of, of whether it's too much art or, or too little art, that's the, the, the issue of each designer. This is what they chose, to, how they chose to present themselves. Perhaps also, I think, I don't like this, these, the, these sort of bo uh, boundaries between art and design and you know products and you know I think it should all flow into one another and I think we do need art art is very important so you know it is the way it is because of that
But you make an interesting, interesting point, and I think that the age of your son is, is, you know, he's 16, and I think there's something that's happening with a, a young generation, and, and perhaps it's, not, it's nothing new, perhaps every young generation is like this, but I really get a sense that from his age range through to uh, graduation from school and university, um, I think there's a lot of designers or, or a lot of um, uh, students who, who are, who are th looking at us and thinking we're kind of mad, you know, walking around big trade halls looking at um, chairs and things. And, and, and I think there's a genuine appetite from a young generation to, to solve some of the problems that I talked about. And um, they are moving away from this uh, designer as ego thing where, you know, I created this, I get the credit, thank you very much. I think there's a young generation that are really keen to work together and collaborate. Uh, the ego is out, goes out the door uh, and some fascinating projects are coming out of some of the schools today. Um, a real appetite for, to use design for social change. So I think that's really exciting. In fact, uh, one of the shows that is staged in Dubai, the Dubai Design Week, is called the Global Grad Show and they did it for the first time last year. And it, they brought together design uh, schools, I think it was 10 design schools from around the world. And they showcased ideas from those students, some really great ideas for some of these problems we've talked about. And, and some of the problems are, are tiny, but they improve people's lives. And I think the great thing about design is the optimism that it brings to our lives. Uh, that really is what makes me get up every day and work in this industry. Uh, and I think a design week is a celebration of that optimism. Um, I think it, we all come away feeling inspired and invigorated from what we see. Uh, and I think in many respects for um, uh, your son and his generation, the future is, is, is very bright. Maybe that's a point to end on. Well, thank you. That's a very nice point to end on, actually. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm sure Sahel and Max will be happy to talk to you individually now. Uh, but please give them a hand and thank them for...